Hey, everybody. Welcome to our Cider Conversations. And this particular conversation is focused on race and cider. I'm Scott Ramsey. I'm the executive director of the New York Cider Association. And I started in this role on March 1st. So if you can think back to March 1st, <laughs> that seems like many lifetimes ago for all of us, right? So we have been through a lot, um, certainly with the COVID-19 epidemic and now facing um, some really important issues around systemic racism in our country. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I sent a note out to our membership, uh, just highlighting the fact that one of the things that attracted me to this role was the fact that, you know, part of the mission of the New York Cider Association is all about the cultivation of the New York cider industry. And when I think of the word cultivate, I get excited about that because I think of the word growth and development and improvement. And so now more than ever, I feel as if we have an opportunity to really, um, really help develop and, and improve and grow from what we're going through right now, which are some really challenging, challenging circumstances. So it is my absolute privilege and honor to introduce to you uh, Megan Larmer from Glenwood, who is a director of the Regional Food Program at Glenwood, and Stephen Whetstone, who is, I'm sorry, Stephen Satterfield, who is from Whetstone Magazine and Whetstone Media. Um, and we're gonna have a conversation led by Megan around race and cider. Um, they're gonna talk for a little while and then uh, we'll have some time at the end for some Q and A. Um, I'm gonna back off the screen and let them do what they do best, but thank you both so much. And Megan, uh, take it away. Great, thanks very much, Scott. Hi, Stephen, it's so good mm -hmm. to see you and to see your face in this, this virtual mm -hmm. setting. I'm so grateful to have you here. Same, same. So before we get started, I just want to acknowledge that for folks who are joining us, I know for you and I, um, anyone who is Zooming in or uh, video conferencing in from anywhere in North America is most likely doing so, almost certainly doing so on land that was uh, stolen through state-sanctioned genocide from the native inhabitants and indigenous peoples of this country. Uh, and to take a moment to recognize the land I'm sitting on uh, is by all rights, the land of the Lenape peoples and uh, make a moment for this group to hold myself accountable to my commitment to acknowledging the complicity of my pioneer ancestors in that genocide and uh, finding the ways that I can in my sphere of power to repair that relationship. So if we could just have a small moment to think about where we stand as we ground ourselves in this conversation. Um, as Scott mentioned, I'm the director of regional food. I use she, her pronouns. And uh, the work I do at Glenwood is focused on coalition building. One of the most important coalitions that we've been able to foster is amongst cider makers and apple growers. Uh, it has been an amazing journey that has led to the development and evolution of the New York Cider Association. Um, and one that I'm very, uh, feeling very honored and privileged and um, grateful for the opportunity in this moment in this developing a new industry to respond to the civil unrest that is quite rightly happening in our country um, and that is pointing out all of the, uh, the ruptures that have existed for many centuries and that we have this community in which to discuss these things and think about um, what we can do to change them. So uh, Stephen and I know each other through this food world and um, have had the chance to discuss some of these topics before. So I'm really looking forward to just opening that conversation up to the group the group that's here. So Stephen, as, um, as Scott mentioned, is not only a media producer, but has decades of experience in the wine industry and the food and beverage industry and is just a smart and generous uh, human being to some of these tough topics with. So, um, thank you. So, thank you. <laughs> All right, and I think one important thing to, to note for folks who are tuning in is our intent here is to have really a, a, a frank and personal conversation. So um, I'm certainly speaking on behalf of myself as I welcome uh, my fellow white folks and other folks into what can be a, a um, vulnerable conversation for people and acknowledge that we're going to, I'm going to get things wrong. And the least we can do is be brave enough to do that because the circumstances certainly call for it. Mm -hmm. So yes. with, with all of, with all of my introductions aside, <laughs> yes. um, I thought we could start Stephen 
by reflecting on the history of agriculture in the United States and mm -hmm. the ways in which that agriculture is built on the back of the enslavement of, of black peoples. And if you would um, be willing to share some of your perspective and the research you've done and your, your lived experience of what, mm -hmm. what that means in the work that you do. Yeah. Um, I just want to also say that I so much appreciate, you know, all of your um, necessary preambles, you know, and grounding these conversations. I know for um, people who um, are just coming around to some of these thoughts, um, you know, the main thing that I um, try to bring forth in these difficult conversations and even really in our, our work um, is a kind of uh, mindfulness, you know, as almost like a central thesis of thinking about things, um, in our case, food um, and, and stories, right? As we are, are purveyor of food stories. So um, by you doing land acknowledgements, um, uh, making caveats around vulnerability, um, I think as much as the content of the stuff that we're about to get into, um, I really feel uh, it's it's the right spirit to kind of meet these um, conversations with. So I appreciate that. Um, and yeah, one, you know, this is an extraordinary time, I think it goes without saying. Um, and, you know, I think for many of us, no matter what our... Um, journey with racial justice um, or healing uh, or activism was prior to say the last month um, we're all being confronted with uh, a new boundary or a new sense of what that relationship looks like and of course the answer is different for all of us um, but uh, this is a good opportunity for everyone I think to um, you know, as we like to do with Whetstone, begin with origins, right? Begin with um, going to the beginning and creating uh, a framework of, of understanding how we got to the place that we got to, you know, 400 years in the case of enslaved Africans and 500 years um, of, of horror and brutality and white supremacy, you know, what are the true origins of this? Um, and, you know, colonization is an easy answer, um, but I will just address your question more specifically um, related to agriculture, because in looking at the origins of agriculture in this country, you also see the, the origins of the manifestation of white supremacy in this country. Um, by that, I mean the reason that African people found their way to the United States, um, what became the United States, was through enslavement, was through forced labor. Um, th the only relationship African and later African American people have ever had to uh, white people has been one of extracted labor. And it's a relationship that began, um, you know, of course, on the land and um, kind of manifested into more nuanced ways of, of uh, culture and society um, and our judicial systems and, and policing systems and so on. So, um, you know, uh, there's so much that can be said about <laughs> what happened in the four centuries um, and the ways in which the exploitation manifested. Um, but I think fundamentally, even when we look at the things that plague our food system today and the things that plague agriculture today, inequity, health disparity, um, so-called food deserts, um, these are all things that we see disproportionately affecting people of color, particularly black people. And these are things that really are rooted in this uh, foundational extractive relationship to the land. That's right. And I think, I, you know, I, I think that's a really key element for us to understand as people who work in food and farming, that the land, the debt of the land is not only 
in the, the way we think of land as a commodity, as a material that is here to sell and to trade, but in the labor that was, that was absolutely stolen from the humans who made that land into the productive landscape that fuels our agricultural economy today. And I really uh, appreciate you um, lifting up that that is not a history that has disappeared, not only because that debt has never been repaid in any any form, but because that ex those extractive labor processes have been translated into our contemporary operations. And um, I think this is this is a useful moment to, to do two things. One is to think about the reality of slavery in New York. I think that this is a, a history that it is easy um, for white folks to brush aside and is not taught very often. We're um, caught up in the narrative that the North was on the right side of the Civil War and have largely erased the markers of what the history was here prior to that. That one of the largest slave markets in the country was in Manhattan that one in 10 households in the Hudson Valley itself held slaves at the turn of the 18th century. Um, so I, I want to say out loud, we are in no way exempt from that history here and that it's incredibly important to remember that the land, the land here and the work done here um, was on the back of that brutal and violent violation of, of, of what we understand as human rights um, in any setting. So, mm -hmm. uh, there are ways for us to educate ourselves about that, and you know maybe we can pop some some readings into into the notes at some point for people who are more interested in that, um, as as we all should be. But to acknowledge that that system of understanding labor as um, separate from the ownership of the land, separate from the relationship to the land, continues, and mm -hmm. that that uh, intergenerational trauma of being forced to work the land for someone else's benefit. Um, continues to play into the way the way we operate today. So I wanted to raise that up. Uh, sorry, yeah, go ahead, Stephen, if you want to tie up the day. Yeah, I think it's really important what you're saying about um, the stories that we tell ourselves to um, assuage concerns that we might actually be the people who we fear, right? Or who are or who we condemn rather. Um, the idea that the North, the Union, was some sort of um, haven for Black people is a convenient story, but it's it's really, um, it doesn't check out at any point historically. Um, just because the institution of slavery didn't exist in the same way, the underlying um, issues of uh, exploitative labor extraction, racialized violence. Um, these are all things that existed in the North. Um, and the, you know, I think one of the caveats as people are now engaging with history, um, which is a great thing, um, is the, the tendency to want to think about it as um, a historical event, something mm -hmm. that happened a long time ago that is um, only tangentially related to the way of the world now because of the way things change. But I think that, you know, we should start to think about these historical relationships um, as more kind of foundational, mm -hmm. not historical, but as a foundational relationship to explain what got us here not to say, well, it used to be like that and now it's like this. No, it's always been only one way. And so this is um, a truth that we need to, to be imbued in. And one way that um, people tell themselves this convenient um, story about good and evil is to make the Union and the Confederacy seem so big uh, to the degree that it's almost like ambivalent it's hard to picture and, and especially when you talk about you know the the scale of, of death and the magnitude of death um, it is really hard to imagine so I prefer to um, try and humanize these these narratives um, of what was really happening in uh, these colonies at the time and um, you know it's like and then in that truthfulness there's actually more spaciousness i think for um white people to feel less absolved actually 
Mm. Right? When you really start to confront these stories, what were white people doing there? Well, there's white people from all over the place. Of course, they were going there to enrich themselves. Yes. They were looking for land. Yes. They were looking for a better life. They were poor peasants, non-land owning people from other places in Europe. Like this is the same reason why people in theory come to the US today for a better life, for land, for opportunity. So what happened once they arrived is that they, benefited tremendously from a system of white supremacy that had uh, created a racialized caste system that made African, African American people a subservient class that was not able to own land. And by keeping them as, and by them I mean us, a landless people, that it would forever perpetuate um, this subservient racialized uh, relationship. And so, you know, when you just say like good and evil mm -hmm. and you don't engage in that history, you're actually, you know, you're not uh, assuaging any of the anxieties that you might have about whatever uh, your morality is or isn't because it's not really confronted. You know, you haven't really taken it to task and you haven't done yourself any good in that. Um, and so up in New York, uh, yeah, there are Dutch people who had very different ways of uh, culture and sensibilities than French people in St. Louis uh, in the mid in Illinois, who had very different ways and sensibilities than English people, um, you know, in Virginia and so on. Um, but what they did all do was exploit black labor, right? And I think that is the part that we we need to kind of be aware of as we're talking about the nuances of these different stories. The one unifying thing is the thing that continues to plague us, which is the the exploitation of specifically black labor, but also um, uh, black creativity, black arts, black culture, any every aspect of blackness uh, exists in the white imagination for the last 400 years, specifically for the purposes of commodification mm -hmm. and profiting. And that is a relationship that did begin on the land. And that is a relationship that even though there were no monolithic white person or people for the union, good and evil, any of this, all of the European white people eventually coalesced into whiteness and identity of whiteness that uh, at the time and continues to subjugate and disenfranchise black people. That's, that's so powerful what you're saying. And I know, you know, you and I share a passion for, for finding the origins of the stories and you have, mm -hmm. you have dedicated your life to that. And I, so there's, there's a couple of things I want to make sure that we highlight in what you're saying. One, one being, um, you know, as, as Leah Penniman, who is also here in the Hudson Valley of Soul Fire Farm, writes and speaks so beautifully about, we must acknowledge, A, that the fundamental difference between the European and white settlers who came here for opportunity, who certainly, um, there are ways to empathize with that desire, absolutely, came in a, a situation of consent. And we must first really recognize that, that that was not true for African people. That was a theft of, as you say, genius and life and family and all of the, the richness of humanity, which um, without recognizing, you know, as you were speaking about the, the importance of recognizing this history to, to me as a white person, it feels like that is the roadmap for repairing this relationship. If you can't mm -hmm. look at and see the harms that have been done, there is no path forward in a consensual relationship because you are denying the, the reality of exactly whom you would wish to repair that relationship with. Mm -hmm. um, so in, I just want to pull, pull forward that that, that attention to origin is so important. Mm -hmm. um, and to think about it, you know, but, well, we'll, we'll turn a little more specifically to drinks and cider in a minute, but I want to, to give a chance to, um, breathe some air into the concept of white supremacy. There is a reaction I'm sure people have seen all over social media in the wake of um, 
the deserved moral outrage that is happening now around the, the state sanctioned murder of black state sanctioned murder of black men that white supremacy somehow is only overt acts of racism. Um, and as, as we sort of started the call with, I, I just wanna dive into that phrase a little bit more clearly to recognize that um, white supremacy is the governing body of the United States, of the culture that we all grew up in. As you were saying, it is based in commodification of, um, of non-white people and of all of the richness of their lives. And we cannot, as white people, have escaped that. Like I want to, I want to say clearly, there is um, to absolve people. I guess not absolve. Absolve is not the right word, but to recognize, to pull out some of the 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 like curse word nature of racism, of acknowledging racism, acknowledging that you, that I have racist thoughts and racist actions, and that the most anti-racist thing. I, I can do with those is to name them and to disrupt the oppression of racism that makes white people complicit in being silent about that mm -hmm. um, and perpetuating that harm. So um, I wanted to, to make sure we name that for anyone who might be feeling some confusion around what white supremacy as an operating system is. It is really entrenched in our economic models um, and in the founding of this nation. So I just wanted to, to pull that out. Um, we will respond to that, or if you'd like, we can. I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit about how white supremacy and racism show up in the drinks industry and in your in your broader experience working within that world. Yeah. Um, well, you know, now that we have that framework, um, I think really um, for any person of color who's worked in the beverage industry in the US um, and probably outside of the US, um, there are innumerable stories um, that reinforce the system that we're describing. Um, in my own experience, the way that it manifested most often um, was a challenge to my authority. Mm -hmm. Um, and this happened mostly table side as a sommelier, opening bottles um, after the sommelier had been called for or requested and I showed up. It was like an awkward moment or more often a confrontational moment. Um, and I think that it really speaks to um, just how exhausting the duality of blackness um, can be in non-black spaces um, and how actually difficult it is to be in uh, non-black spaces and how rare it is. Um, I've, I, one thing that um, is really hard for white people to understand is that um, because of this historical relationship and because of this historical dynamic of exploitation um, and violence, when black communities and often brown communities see white people showing up, it means they're in danger, you know? And what's really unusual for the white people who work in the US beverage industry is to be in a room in which there might be uh, 100 or 200 black people or non-white people, and they might be the only one, which is what happens if you go to a, a trade tasting. And so, I, and I think that the, the burden of that as a beverage professional or any professional, because the same thing is true in innumerable professions, what ends up happening is when we, let's say, which I didn't, but let's say I wanted to go for the MS mm. or the MW. You know, if I wanted to actually be a part of, let's say, the institution that would give me the accreditation, that would give me the validation, which would give me the title so that maybe if I went back to the table, you know, I would, but the truth is there is no, there's no title. There's no amount of validation because what, what it is, is, is racism. 
And, and racism doesn't have to be mean and malicious and antagonistic. It's oftentimes quiet and silent. And um, these are actually the ways in which it's the most harmful, as you alluded to earlier, it, the ways that are unnamed because they're, they're allowed to fester. And so I think that um, the reckoning that's happening all over the country, the world, in our relative and respective industries um, is timely. But I think as, uh, especially as white people are trying to um, maybe in some case, even summon the empathy, summon the understanding, like why is this such a big deal all of a sudden? Believe me, black folks are asking ourselves the same question too. Why now? This is, I mean, we. this is peculiar for us too, you know? I think there's some good theories about the, the convergence of timing and events, but if white folks are saying like, why is this happening now? That's a really good fucking question. We, we should all be asking ourselves that question. I think there's a lot of uncomfortable things to be revealed, you know, in that, particular um, interrogation. But, you know, as I talk about my experiences in the beverage industry, it just becomes clear that it is a microcosm for the Black experience in predominantly white spaces as we move through our professional ranks. And so what ends up happening is we don't uh, see the same tenure because we don't see the same kinds of um, advancement opportunities because fundamentally the people who could change our lives, give up those opportunities, we're not in relationship to white people in the same way. And so there's a kind of othering that happens where it becomes a pipeline problem. But the problem is a, a, a dormant but very much present uh, kind of racism that exists within people and institutions and circles of power that has created an entire white village that has not allowed any other ideas or cultures to permeate that in meaningful ways. And what's happened is then Black folks who cannot stay in tenure, who are not supported on the job, who are not understood, who do feel real a real kind of anxiety that is a, tied to the multi-generational trauma, we lose the opportunity. And we're in fact blamed for our lack of visibility in the industry. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's perpetuated over and over, whether you're talking about sommeliers or winemakers or anything. So I think that my little story there is a story that any black or brown person in our industry has experienced, but as useful as I think it is to talk about things with a great deal of specificity, um, I, that's only so that we can then zoom out and see the ways in which <laughs> we're actually talking about uh, a collective issue, a much broader issue, a universal issue of anti-Black racism, because it's pervasive. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think I think to, to help color in some of that, story from my experience as a white person working in the restaurant industry for a decade as well. I think there is um, some of that pipeline problem arises from the, the very implicit racism of uh, deciding what, like what black people like as white people, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of um, what maybe even, you know, I saw fellow, fellow servers see this as an extension of their skill set as a hospitality professional to make assumptions about what um, a person would want to eat or drink based on the color of their skin, not just black people, but any non-white person. Whereas there was a latitude allowed to white consumers that mm -hmm. they may have a very broad range of tastes and may enjoy any number of things. So I, I, I bring that up only as a corollary to how I think of the industry itself, because at the, at the core of the drinks industry is, is this sense of hospitality, right. And of, um, marketing in some way. And so there can be really insidious expressions of the racism that we learn from this society that have to be um, interrogated, you know, mm -hmm. that have to be named in order to be changed. And that, that's, that what seem like small things are actually the fabric of our entire society. Exactly. Right? So you can't, you can't pull out one thread and say, well, um, you know, but we have we have a, a, a Latinx person on our on our exactly. staff who has to be more more comprehensive in our approach to it. And again, just um, you know, from my own experience, you have to invite the humility of of 
people who are generous enough to tell you when they see it, when you don't. That that's what I. That's what uh, you know. We started this conversation talking a bit about this moment as a growing edge, and I just want to invite. Um, I want to invite other people to live the growing edge of being grateful for for things being revealed that are difficult for us to see, right? Difficult for white people to see. Mm-hmm. And recognizing the trust that is inherent in someone being willing to tell you that because there is um, every reason to fear that that that, that would be a, a risk that could do at minimum professional harm. Um, and as we've seen bodily harm in many cases. So to have the, the humility and gratitude to engage with um, mm-hmm. our friends who are willing to tell us that that they see it's, it's such a good point you know i um this labor that i'm describing you know this this duality um is when people it's it's funny like now that we're having more open dialogue about race um like you you know you see more black voices creatives accounts being amplified and you know, black folks have been talking to each other like this all along, but basically like in unison or saying like, yo, I'm tired, this is exhausting, this is exhausting. Because, and what that means is that on top of all of the very real trauma, you know, and I don't I don't wanna just like gloss over the, like when we're talking about feeling trauma, you know, in your body, in your chest, in your mind, what that really, how restrictive that really is to be embodied as merely a part of the Black experience. It's asking so much. And then to see your humanity devalued in so many ways, like when we are asking why now, because this is something that we've had to come to work every day to work for white institutions, corporations, embodying that trauma without so much of as a mention and acknowledgement of what was really happening for black people outside of those very institutions. And that is a kind of gaslighting actually. Yeah. Because if you can imagine what would happen if white people in this country felt the trauma of their lives being under siege by the government based on their whiteness? And that exaggerated fear is actually the main pickup line for white supremacists who love to be heavily armed. And and they're arming themselves for some sort of imagined racial revolution to protect their women and their whiteness. You know, it's tied to the same brand of white, hetero male patriarchy that in the patriarchal sense, I myself have and continue to benefit from, but have also been really hit hard by as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, I mean, I know we haven't really talked about cider that much, but I, I really don't, if we're really trying to engage honestly and earnestly in talking about race and understanding race, you know, we talked about humility being a condition for that to happen. And if a black person in this moment takes the time to tell you a fucked up thing that was said several months ago or years ago or a way they were made to feel or how they feel about the discrepancy between the press release and the black square versus how the board of directors is looking you know white people have to hold that because actually to me especially as someone who is like i'm here be- out of affection for you and for and for New York Cider and for Glenwood, but I'm exhausted as a black person, yeah. right? So like, I actually think that if you are in community, especially with a black person who's giving you real feedback in this moment, it's an enormous gift and it should be held as such. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I, I certainly, 
want to thank you for giving that gift. I'm not saying that I'm a gift. I'm just I'm not, you are a gift. Not whole, but in large, it's a lot to hold right now, is what I'm saying. I, I, I yeah, I, th- I, I, yeah, I absolutely want to to honor that both on an individual and on a a, a, a broader scale, and in, in the spirit of naming some of the the harms that exist and some of the historic erasures that exists within the cider community. Um, one of the conversations that has been fairly active within that community over the last year um, has been around how the, the narrative of, of heritage can be reproductive of um, white supremacist erasures of history, mm-hmm. right? And Olivia Mackey wrote in Malice Magazine last year, as a lot of folks I'm sure on this, this call will have read and will remember, uh, an article called Whose Heritage that specifically um, named out the contributions of Jupiter Evans, who was Thomas Jefferson's um, uh, cider maker and beer brewer and was enslaved by Thomas Jefferson. And we need, I, I personally feel very strongly that we need as a cider community to recognize that if we are using the term heritage as code word for colonization, and if we are lifting up the um, a noble story of our colonial forefathers, while there are, as in any human life, things worth um, celebrating and recognizing as contributions, that we have to tell the other side of that story also. There is no, uh, there is no true community, as you were saying. You cannot be in community if you cannot tell a full story. And if we are only telling the story of the winners of history, of those who have benefited from the extraction of um, labor and knowledge, uh, then we are we're doing ourselves a disservice and we are not making the opportunity to repair that relationship as we, as we talked about a little bit earlier. So I certainly want to name the contributions of Jupiter Evans and also to think about here specifically in the Hudson Valley, how we can hold the truth of what we have created as a cider community and look to make that better. So one of our most beloved apples is the Asopus Spitzenberg. The Asopus were a tribe that was driven off of their lands. So the name of the apple already holds that trauma within it. Um, it is a great and delicious apple. And we need to hold that is true. The town of Asopus is famous for that apple. It ought to be just as famous for being the birthplace of Sojourner Truth who was born into enslavement in a Dutch family there and walked her way to freedom and later freed um, her sons through legal action, which to imagine what it would have been to have been a a multilingual black woman sitting on the steps of a courthouse that you could not enter as you fought for the life of your wrongly stolen son, that we need to tell that story of our land and of our heritage as much as as we tell the story of Johnny Appleseed or Mm -hmm. of the, the discovery of that specific apple. Um, and in, in naming that, I want to recognize some of the um, wonderful work that's, that's happened with Metal House Cider, um, which is run by Kimberly Kay, who has made a, a, a commitment to performing just on a business level, because I also want to give people potentially some tangible actions they can take within their community. So uh, Kimberly has decided with her business to make her own personal act of reparations to the community of Asopus um, by giving a proceed from that bottle to uh, the African slave cemetery that is being restored in that town. And so just as a, a, a opportunity for inspiration for folks who are trying to find a way that they can take their own resources, their own privilege and act right now at this moment when um, I'm grateful to see that people are feeling spurred spurred to action. Uh, so I wanted to, to share that to share that with the group as an opportunity um, for your own personal business. It's a it's a very actionable, actionable item. And I give great respect to Kimberly for your, um, having provided that that example for for the community. Mm-hmm. Um, I would like to talk a little bit also about um, the reality of the the current labor market in the Hudson Valley in our cider community. Um, As is no surprise to anyone who grows apples here, the land is extraordinarily expensive. The operation is expensive. The generational wealth that has accumulated for white people disproportionately um, to people of any other color in this country, specifically because of the thefts that we were speaking of, has made that land much more accessible. 
and to name that much of the expertise, the agricultural expertise and labor that happens in those orchards is being performed by people of color, whether those be um, H-2A visa workers who have been coming for decades, who have come as, as families, fathers and sons, every single year, know the land like the back of their hand, know the trees, really are bearers of that incredible knowledge. Um, or if that is migrant workers from other, other parts of the world, often Latinx workers, these are heroes of our industry that we need to name, support, and find active ways to, um, to bring into the narrative that we tell about our work. So uh, I very much invite my fellow cider community friends to reach out to me to be, um, to be engaged in this conversation of how we can move forward on creating a benefit for those people who give so much to the apples that we grow and the, the cider that we um, enjoy making and drinking. As, as it has been accrued to the owner operators of, of cideries. And um, I don't want to paint paint anything with a broad brush because this conversation, as you so well put, Stephen, it's all about moving from the specific of the nuance to understand the structure that is, that is making that nuance a universal experience rather than a particular experience. Um, but to say that I know there are many good hearts and minds in this community who want that. And as a, as a call to action to say the time, the time is well past when we can do that. Um, mm -hmm. So thinking a bit, you know, something that gives me hope, and I'll say to folks on this call also, we'll move to questions in just a minute or two, um, is that the cider industry is also positioned in a, in a nice spot where we often bemoan that we don't have a clear drinks category, right? That it, people don't know exactly what cider is. Um, but as the wonderful Dr. J points out, uh, that is our opportunity as compared to something like craft beer that had to really fight against the loggers or only for you know white middle-aged cisgender guys and had a, t a difficult time opening up to any broader category. So mm -hmm. this is an opportunity for us where we have, we have the chance in this fairly young industry to not get calcified in the stories that we tell about who this drink is for and, and who is able to make and produce, produce this drink and who's valued in it. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so I, I'd love to hear your reflections on that, Stephen, and, and any any thoughts you might have. Yeah, that's an excellent point um, about the opportunity uh, in this for the cider industry at large. Um, how your sort of nascency is actually this is a great moment. Um, I want to just re quickly reflect on something that you just mentioned prior to that, though. Um, in talking about land and we you talked about you know reparations as a specific example you know that's another area where i would actually invite people to pause um and really reflect on ways in which we currently can build businesses and best practices in a a reparative framework in a framework of uh both understanding and root it in the past, but also understands and root it in the reality and the ways that the profiting continues, mm -hmm. right? Like that connection has to be made. It's not enough to feel the empathy, to see the wrong. If you don't see how you continue to profit every second from the institution of white supremacy, if you don't understand, if you don't know what redlining is, I mean, like, if you really don't know that, you have to Google that. You have to read a book, you know, and you have to understand that we're not talking about something from hundreds of years ago. It's decades ago. My grandfather was such a brilliant man. He could not go to college. His name was Vernon Satterfield. He had a white sounding name. He had amazing tests. You know, he wanted to go to University of Illinois. They offered him a scholarship. When he showed up, they were like, just kidding. That was my grandfather. You know what I'm saying? And so what could my dad's life, who ended up as a mill worker in Gary, Indiana, what would his life have been like if my grandfather actually could have fulfilled that scholarship? Yeah. What would my life have been like if my dad could have then gone to college because he would have had money? If shit, if our education, our dignity, our land wasn't stolen, this is what we're working against. 
So if you see a black person in your industry, like you have to actively engage with these people and say like, you know, not, not over the top, but like you have to mindfully engage and keep them on your radar in a supportive way because what a black person has had to go through to be an entrepreneur, um, to frankly exist in any sector, insider or otherwise, it is a different kind of burden. And if you want to have real, meaningful, lasting, equitable change, not just diversity in your industry, you have to enter those relationships with care. You have to, in, you have to repair those relationships. And often because of its contemporary expression, that does mean a monetary repair. It is a reparations framework. You have to give up money or power or land because these are the things that were stolen. I want to thank you so much for naming that explicitly and to to reiterate it just to make sure that it is heard, that it is um, not a theoretical theft that happened in this country. It is not a theoretical oppression. It is um, very, very real and it is material and it is uh, a constraint that ex constraints, not even the right word. I mean, it's oppression, it's violence that has removed the ability. Oh, no, this is the point where I knew I, I said I was going to say things that I, I, I think um, to open up the vulnerability here, we are we are trained as white people to speak diplomatically. And what I want to say is much stronger than something that is diplomatic. And just to um, reiterate for people who may have had a hard time hearing this, that it is giving away your power and your resources. And that is what anti-racism looks like. And that you have to name that power and resources first, which means you have to name the trauma that was inflicted first. And when, when you are able to do that, that's when you can start to um, think of yourself as, as learning how to be anti-racist, which is um, not what our society wants us to be. So it's a, a, an uphill battle, yeah. 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 Thank you for that, Megan. The vulnerability matters. It really does, you know? So I think, shall we, shall we move to Q&A? We've got just about yeah. two minutes left. Yeah. If, if folks have, have um, anything they'd like, they'd like, or any topics you'd like to hear us uh, address more explicitly, that would be most welcome. You can use the live comments um, chat feature in your screen. And Scott, if you have more clear directions than I have, feel free to hop on. <laughs> no, 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 that's great. Um, yeah, so just so everybody knows, there you have the capability to comment. Those comments come through, and we can take a look at those if you have questions or, as Megan pointed out, um, elements you'd like to hear more about. I, you know, Stephen, you said something earlier that I thought was really profound, as everything has been, <laughs> quite frankly. This is a lot to really, really some, some amazing information to think about. But you were talking about the whole... Um, you know, North versus South, um, you know, Union versus Confederacy, like ideals and these very distinct differences and the re and, and when you really look at the very personal experiences across all of those spaces, it becomes a very different, um, a very different sort of thing to think about. And I think, you know, those devices of us versus them are still so strongly at play today. And so, you know, I don't know if I'm asking a question or maybe I just want to hear you talk a little bit more about you know, in, in today's contemporary time, you know, in our in our current lives, when we're, you know, we're still dealing with those, you know, being very different from somebody else or us versus them. And so in this space of thinking about how we move forward and trying to make it more personal or understanding from a more personal perspective, like what are your what are your thoughts on that? Um well I, I think the us versus them sort of rhetoric that you're talking about is mainly rooted in the the political um which uh is rooted in the racial you know i mean this is what the campaign um was run on um this is what uh, no less than um half of the the our party us um or the gop has upheld you know, um, on the whole, me personally, I I don't have faith in institutions. 
you know, these institutions were created by people who enslaved people to enrich themselves. Everyone who signed, you talk about the big signatures on the Declaration of Independence, it was a farce. It's always been a farce for Black people here. It's never not been. So us versus them, I don't know who us is other than Black people who are discriminated against and killed by the state. And who is them? I don't know who them is. We should all be very, very concerned that any U.S. citizen would be disproportionately targeted and assassinated by their government with impunity, especially when it's being done by other civilians whose salaries we pay for. Yes. That's an all of us problem. Absolutely agreed. And I think, you know, I was having this conversation recently with my partner, Brian, and we were talking about, um, you know, where I get, where I stumble is, um, you know, this, this American idea, right? This equal rights idea and what a beautiful, wonderful, glorious thing that is. And, you know, the, the, the Thomas Jefferson um, factor that Megan, you mentioned earlier and, and how we've thought about the word heritage and what that really means. Um, and so what, I, what I've come to is this place of, I still really want to believe in that idea. I mean, I think it is such a beautiful idea. And, you know, the reality is that people that have helped to form that idea, when you think about, you know, the individuals who signed that Declaration of Independence, um, you know, they, they didn't necessarily, um, I don't, I, I'm in the same place where I don't want to say anything wrong or inappropriate. And I want to say this correctly, but, um, you know, they were doing the best they could, but they didn't, you know, they weren't upholding what the real reality of that was. Right. And so I guess what I'm getting to is I still like to believe that this idea is possible. And so my, my question is, is that fair to think like that this idea of, you know, inclusivity and equal rights and and the language in the declaration of independence like that should absolutely still be our mantra right but we just need to we need to uphold it in a different way and work towards it in a more fair and equitable way right because we have this information now am i i don't know do you mind if i if i jump in quickly please, to please. See if that'd be all right so i i think this gets back to this idea of telling the entire story right that the the founders of the constitution absolutely believed in equality for the people that they saw as humans and the people that they saw as humans were white male landowners. So if that is a a value that we can see the words and say the words of equality mean something to us, we equally have to say we have changed the meaning of those words, right? And that we are choosing. And I think that's where, um, Stephen, I feel like we were referencing this idea of accountability, right? That all of us as members of this nation need to take accountability for the fact that we have um, created a state in which uh, civilians have a certain suit on, and that means they can kill other civilians without repercussion, right? That's something to be accountable for. I think we also have to be accountable for our choice to change, to change what those words mean right? And to see them in a a, a truer light rather than, to me, it's rather than saying, well, they were, they were thinking well, but within the context of their history, no, they were not, to me, no, they were not thinking well, they were thinking poorly. They had a, a, a blind vision, but gave us something that we can perhaps build on and become, um, the world we'd all rather live in. I hope we'd all rather live in. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Stephen, I jumped in there if, you, if you'd That's like. Fair. That's perfect. Yeah. All right, we do have a chat box question. Thank you, Kylene Martin, for putting that out there. Um, do you want to read it out loud, Scott, or do you want to summarize? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so Kylene is just um, asking, like, what kind of encouragement or accountability measures um, to honor and repay the black and indigenous contributions to the modern cider industry are being issued from the New York Cider Association to the members, makers and owners. This is a phenomenal question. Um, you know, Megan, you can certainly um, help me answer this as um, you know, a member of our board and part of the executive committee of our board. But my perspective is, you know, this is something that we absolutely need to talk about and think about. Um, 
there's a lot of work to be done in this space. And I don't think, you know, we're talking about hundreds of years of a scenario that we need to very carefully think about how do we lay the right groundwork to move forward. Um, and so I guess my answer is that I don't have an answer at this moment, but it's absolutely something um, that I think we're very, that we, that we need to think about. And, and much to what you all were talking about earlier, I am, I am filled with a level, you know, with, with a type of excitement because I do think we're at a space where we can really, we can grow this industry into something that is accountable and, and is thoughtful and is telling the whole story. Um, as we, as we move forward, we're positioned in a really, in a really beautiful way to do that. And I, I get very excited when I think about that. So Megan, do you, do you think that's a fair answer? I do. Yeah. And I'll just add to it. Um, the New York Cider Association is, is a membership based organization. So this is not an organization that exists separate from apple growers and separate from cider makers. You are the New York Cider Association if you are a member of the New York Cider Association. And so I ask, I ask you to join in building those accountability measures and would, would love to have your participation in that Kylene and anyone else who feels, who feels called to do that because it is again, our accountability, our responsibility to make this happen not to ask for instruction from our black and brown fellow humans as how to do it. We, we, are, we are the responsible ones here, right? So I, I wanna start by saying that. And I want to um, really plainly acknowledge that the, the New York Cider Association has not actively done uh, the degree of internal work that would give us an answer to that question right now. And we are responsible to do that work internally so that any actions we do take are not causing harm and to reach out and find out if the actions we want to take are meaningful. So just to say there is lots of internal work to do. I am incredibly inspired by various cideries who are doing that work, uh, their own businesses and really welcome the opportunity to bring that, to bring that work into conversation in your trade association, which is exactly what that trade association is for. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then we have a quick question from Ashley Hemming. Um, Stephen, just asking to little talk a little bit more about sort of what you're doing. I'm, you know, um, you know, she wants to hear more about you and how she can support and what we can do to sort of stay in touch with you going forward. Thanks, Ashley. Um, well, I uh, publish a print magazine called Whetstone. Um, we have a media company of the same title, and basically. Um, we make magazines, we make podcasts, we make videos. Uh, it's all through um, a lens of origin, anthropology, indigeneity, um, really looking at food as a, as a means of understanding. Um, and yeah, I've been doing that for the last um, three years. Um, we have our sixth volume, uh, which will be out in August. So if people want to support my work, you can definitely go to whetstonemagazine.com and get a subscription to our print magazine. Um, that's the simplest and most tangible way. We have uh, digital subscriptions as well. Fantastic. In the, in the sake of full transparency, see there's also a desire to make sure that you're you're getting paid for your time, Stephen. You, you are, that's not, um, yeah. Cider Association is equally committed to making sure that uh, Thank we are you. not asking more of, of you than you've already given, which is a tremendous amount. And definitely subscribe to the magazine. It is really good. <laughs> it is. It's really good. And the podcast also very good. Yeah. And we'll be sure and put links to all of that in the description on this video as it sits on in the YouTube description. Uh, we can continue to, to promote that there as well. Thanks. Appreciate that. All right. Well, uh, unless, unless there's any other questions that puts us that puts us right at time, and uh, I, lo I love ending a, a thing on time. Uh, <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> but I, I just want to take one more moment just to 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 say how grateful I am to be in community with you, Stephen, and how lucky the New York mm. Association is to have um, your good thinking and good heart helping Thank us along you. this path. So. Thank you. Much love. Thank you, Megan. Thanks, Scott. Absolutely. It's been our pleasure. Um, Stephen, thank you so, so much. Um, and Megan, thank you as well for moderating such a beautiful discussion. Um, there's so much more of this to be had, clearly. Um, and like I said at the very beginning, there's, um, you know, this is an opportunity that we have to grow and to develop and improve. Um, and I'm, I am very hopeful um, in such a challenging time to see that, that we can take advantage of that 
um, and look forward to what that really means. And, and, you know, there are going to be, as Megan said, moments of vulnerability and, and uncomfortable and things of the, that nature, but um, with the kind of patience and courage and, and conversations like this, we can, we can move forward in a really powerful way. And that really, really excites me and makes me very hopeful. So thank you all so much for joining. Thank you again to Stephen and Megan. Um, and um, that's it. All right. So. Thanks everybody. Hope to see Cheers. you all in real life soon. Thanks. <laughs>